So this is Aubrey Fox. I'm today's guest host for the New Thinking Podcast, which is the Center for Court Innovations uh, podcast where we interview legal experts and researchers. And I'm joined today, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be joined today by Professor James Grenier, who is a, the uh, William Henry Bloomberg Professor of Law at Harvard University. Does this mean that you're connected to uh, our, our former Mayor Bloomberg? Actually, I think that if I have it right, that the, the uh, chair was named after his father, and he established it in, on, on his father's behalf. And it's a it's a, a rotating chair, so I have it for I guess another few months before it rotates to someone else. So, but that is the connection. So you're not you're not dining with uh, Mayor Bloomberg on a regular basis. I haven't I haven't had the pleasure yet. I'm sure it'll be terrific. Um, you know, I'm I'm guessing he probably sets a good table, but I haven't had the pleasure yet. <laughs> Among many things, Jim is the faculty director of something called the Access to Justice Lab, um, which is a really exciting new initiative that he started where he's trying to bring um, evidence-based research to the study of criminal justice and civil justice. And so we're, we want to talk to Jim today about his work with the Access to Justice Lab and also some of his thinking about why it's important to, to introduce this evidence-based approach and, and want to talk to him a little bit about some of the particular issues he's investigated. But Jim, maybe where we'll start is just to let you talk about how you got interested in this area of criminal justice and civil justice, and what t- tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So I, I, when I uh, graduated from law school, I hadn't taken any statistics courses or any sort of quantitative courses in college or anything like that. I was, I was just a, I wanted to be a, a regular practicing lawyer. And so I did that for three years for the Justice Department and then three years for a private law firm, a law firm called Jenner and Block in in D.C. And uh, at the time, I was litigating cases that involved some numbers. So employment discrimination, class actions, litigation about the 2000 decennial census, whether you could use statistical techniques to try to correct for undercounts and overcounts according to racial groups. Um, I'd always been interested in you know, social justice issues and in criminal law issues. When I moved over to the private law firm, I did a couple of pro bono cases uh, that we picked up. And basically, at, at, through the practice, uh, redistricting was another area I did, got interested in numbers um, and, and uh, what numbers and evidence-based thinking could bring to the table in terms of, of social justice issues. And so After six years as a practicing attorney, I um, left the practice of law for five years to get a PhD in statistics. And then when I uh, got out of, I got my PhD in statistics, I started researching and was researching in a bunch of areas, but the one I was having the most fun with, really enjoying, and the one that I thought I could could potentially do some good with was access to justice issues, um, most more on the civil side than on the criminal side, but some on the criminal side also. So issues like um, how do you make law work and be accessible for folks who can't afford to hire lawyers to interface with the legal system? And uh, on, the, on the criminal side, you know, how can we make uh, existing institutions perform what we want them to perform uh, you know, better? How can we release more people who are not dangerous uh, how can we, uh, you know, reduce the the criminal footprint on communities and still maintain a system of law and order, uh, et cetera? So those are the big picture issues that I found most interesting. So having a statistician as a professor of law is that an unusual development, or is that something that's been going on for decades and decades? No, there. I think there are only two of us still um, in the legal academy that have stats degrees, of stat PhDs. Um, I know the other person, unsurprisingly. Um, they're, they're, it, but having you know, someone as a law professor who has, you know, who knows, as we say, how to count, that's not all that unusual. It's just they typically, folks typically have economics degrees or political science degrees or, or something like that. But, uh, but uh, you know, the hardcore statistics is what I really wanted to, to, to get invested in. And the reason for that was I pretty much knew when I was going into the statistics program that I was a litigator through and through. I was always going to be a litigator. I was always going to care about uh, somebody who's going to care about courts and administrative agencies and, and you know, the practice of law at a, at a, at a person by person level. And so I didn't feel like I wanted to learn a lot about the uh, the big picture political science uh, theory and big picture economic theory that the that those folks do. And so I just said, let's go straight into the heavy numbers. And so tell us a little bit about the uh, Access to Justice Lab. What does it do? When did you get it started? 
we're talking in December of 2016. It's only been in existence since July of 2016, and it is it is funded by a generous grant from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. The, the foundation itself cares about evidence-based thinking, you know, across a lot of different spheres, um, and it it funded the lab. And basically, the lab has two overall missions. One is to produce useful, rigorous evidence that would assist policymakers and judges and lawyers in the uh, in what they do, um, it, it, especially with respect again to access to justice for uh, for uh, related to folks who can't afford to hire lawyers to interface with the legal system for them. Um, and then the second uh, overall purpose is to try to tear down the resistance to rigorous empirical evidence, especially via the randomized control trials or a randomized field experiment, uh, um, uh, that resistance that exists within the legal profession and within the, the judiciary. I think that in law, especially with the practice of law, we are roughly where the medical profession was in about, about 1938 or 1940, um, where basically we are beginning to engage in a debate about whether our our profession should be evidence-based in the way that medicine was engaging in a debate about whether uh, drugs and medical devices should have evidence behind them before they are allowed to be sold to the public. Um, and, you know, there are many folks in law uh, and in, and in the, on the, both the bench and the bar who think that randomization in law is unethical or is unnecessary because uh, unethical because you know randomization is you know it takes away the professional judgment about who should get what and unnecessary because we know that as lawyers and judges all of our professional judgments are perfect um, or are very very good and therefore we don't really need to investigate them all that much um, and so the, sec the Access to Justice Lab's second um, purpose is to try to suggest to folks that uh, scientific-based thinking and evidence really can bring a lot to the table, and it may end up uh, overturning accepted truths uh, within the, the, the bench and the bar. And I'm glad in your uh, comparison to the medical world you didn't bring up leeches. So at least we're, <laughs> you, we're, we're 100 years ahead of where you, we could be. Right. And just to follow up for a moment, I, I kind of want to get your sense of the state of play on this, because I, I understand that there may be resistance to RCTs, you know, which are the most rigorous form of uh, evidence based analysis and require dividing a control group from an experimental group and giving some people something that you don't give the control group. But uh, there there is sort of a history of doing research into criminological issues. Um, so it's not like you're starting from square one. So I guess in this mix of, you know, some history and some resistance, where would you say we are at the moment? I'd say more resistance than history with respect to courts and, and, and uh, judges and lawyers. So you're absolutely right that there is a, a reasonably well-developed literature in, in the criminology field, and a good portion of it, not as much as you know, the, many criminologists would like, but still a, a good portion of it um, backed up by randomized studies to try to figure out you know, whether, say, after-school programs prevent people from getting arrested, uh, or, or whether uh, certain types of treatment as a condition for probation are effective in preventing recidivism. But if you notice in the two examples that I um, that I gave you, one of them is sort of prior to the involvement. The intervention is prior to the involvement of the criminal justice system, and one of them is post sentencing, um, sort of after the involvement of what what we call it, you know, the the, the lawyer based or court based criminal justice system. And so there has been substantially less in that that portion of the criminal justice system where the lawyers and the judges get involved. Um, to the point where when a co-author and I tried to catalog all of the randomized studies that had done, been done in United States law, criminal or civil, that involved uh, randomization of a decision that would otherwise have been made by a judge or a lawyer. So that's how we defined you know, randomized studies in law. I mean, we're, we're taking a decision that otherwise would have been made by a judge and a lawyer and randomizing it to find out, you know, whether the decision is worthwhile or, or the effect of subtreatment or something like that. 
we could only find about 50 in the history of the United States, um, you know, based upon all areas of law, all sorts of settings. So if you think about medicine, you know, in, starting from 1938 or 1940, the number would probably be uncountable. It'd be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of randomized studies um, that have involved the uh, 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 replacing a judgment that would have otherwise have been made by a medical professional with randomization or to figure out whether the, the treatment or the intervention works. Whereas we could only we could find fewer than one per year in law. Um, so again, I absolutely agree with you. Criminology has a has a much more of a history. It's a much more developed field, uh, but they are basically working in their rigorous uh, evidence prior to the former legal system or after it in the lifetime of a, of a particular defendant or person or, or crime. Um, and where we think the evidence really needs to, to be focused is, is uh, at least in terms of a new effort, we need to focus on where there, isn't, where there isn't as much evidence right now, which is inside courts and inside law offices. One of the th reasons that I wanted to speak to you, Jim, was the Center for Court Innovation, while we're known more for our work on criminal court programs, we also have been developing uh, a civil justice portfolio. And so I'm, I'm curious to hear you talk about some of the work you've done on issues and you're continuing to do, like debt collection and the assignment of counsel in housing court cases. And, and I'm, I guess the, the framework I have for my question is making the case for this kind of research may rest on finding kind of practical implications that flow from the research. So I'm wondering if you can give us some examples of, of research you're doing and what you see as, you know, the, the things that a practitioner would immediately identify as, well, that's really interesting and useful. Absolutely. So I guess, you know, two examples, and I don't want to go in for too long, so stop me if I, if I just, if this turns into a monologue, but um, two examples with respect to the financial distress work, which you mentioned, the debt collection work that you mentioned, <clears throat> um, one of the premises of that work is that there is just never going to be enough money. There's just never going to be enough of a social commitment to provide uh, a lawyer at state expense for every individual who can't afford to hire a lawyer who has a legal problem. And so um, even if we were to restrict that set to people who are facing you know, court adjudications that um, affect basic human needs by some definition, which is the ABA's proposed definition for what, what's called a civil Gideon project, you know, this idea that we can provide st uh, lawyers state expense, I just don't think the resources is, are ever going to be there. I mean, some smart economists have, have tried to calculate that, and it's in, you know, billions upon billions of dollars would be needed. And so with that in mind, it's probably going to take a, a, a battery of lots of different things to, to address the access to justice problems that we're having in the United States society. And one of those things, one of, that many, one of those many things that we need, uh, is going to be self-help. Um, how are you going to make complex subjects accessible, complex procedures and complex uh, principles to, uh, accessible to folks who can't afford to hire lawyers for them so they can t you know, try to address legal problems they have on their own. And so uh, one of the financial distress work that I'm doing is an attempt to try to say, well, if what we need are self-help materials and we need basically to educate people about how to solve their own problems, what sorts of uh, principles can we draw from non-law fields that would help us make self-help materials more effective, or what we hypothesize that would make self-help materials more effective? So, uh, you know, for instance, if we're trying to get people uh, to a particular location at a particular time of, of day and on a particular date to do something they would rather not do because it's good for them, we think, or it's good, they think it's good for them, they decide it's good for them, how do we persuade people to do that? Well, if you pose the question at that level of generality, you recognize that voting, you know, political scientists study how you get people to vote on a particular day at a particular time. Public health officials study how to get people to, uh, to, to take flu shots or to get colonoscopies on a particular day. These are all studies that have been run. But in law, our self-help materials don't actually use any of the lessons from those other fields about how to get people to a court date. Um, and we think that's, that's bad. We think that if good lessons are learned from those fields, we should try them in law and see if they work. Um, similarly, you know, there's an entire field called adult education or just education period about how you communicate complex concepts to people. Um, who are who uh, you know need to be able to use them, um, but in law our self-help materials don't currently 
uh, use the, the, the lessons from adult education. And you can see that because if you read them, uh, the self, law, legal self-help materials, they're word heavy. They're just lots and lots of text. Whereas adult education folks or education folks generally are saying, no, 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 you got to use, you got to use images. You got to, and so in our case, we're, we're using cartoons. Um, and so the idea there is to say, okay, well, let's try to create um, the best possible self-help materials that under the state of the art, we currently know how to create using the lessons from all these different fields. Um, but then let's don't declare victory there because you know, maybe there's something about law or maybe there's something about the way that we did the self-help materials uh, that, that, that would make them not effective or maybe there's something not understanding or maybe the best possible self-help materials are just not enough in a system that is so complex that self-help is just not an option. Um, and so we, could, we go test them. We go put them into the field and we do a randomized experiment where we, you know, in, in one randomized experiment, we might randomize people to either get self-help materials or an offer of representation from an attorney. Um, or in another experiment, we got randomized whether people get self-help materials versus no, form, no further assistance, you know, our self-help materials versus existing self-help materials, which in many cases just don't exist. Um, and so that's one example. I've got another one, but again, I don't want to go on and on. Yeah, let me just, I'll just cut in for mm -hmm. a moment to say, yep. you know, your, the research you're doing on um, sort of self-help or pro se um, uh, counsel is relevant to us because we run a program called Legal Hands, which essentially mm -hmm. employs volunteers who are not lawyers. And so it's a bit of a blended model. This is, yep. this is people yep. who, are, who are physically talking to uh, a community member, so it's not you know something that you go online to get self help materials, um, but they're not lawyers, and I, it speaks to your general point, which is um, it may not be possible to have a lawyer for every person on every case of relevance to them. Absolutely, and you know what I think what your what your program is doing is is mixing a, a partial service based solution with a partial self help, so it yeah. might be a sort of guided self help and. Absolutely. I mean, you know, again, I think I think part of the problem that one of the reasons why I find this field so much fun to operate in, but also so frustrating is that we just don't have any evidence to suggest to guide us as to when we need a partial service based solution, partial self-help and what settings uh, a, a total self-help solution is sufficient. Yeah. Or maybe it's not the legal setting. It's the type of person. Right. You know, which people can get away, can, can take care of it on their own if guided, you know, appropriately, um, either by self-help materials or which ones are going to need, uh, you know, some, some service along with it. So absolutely. Let's hear your other example. Um, another example that comes to mind is, is the problem of triage, um, which is, you know, basically whenever there is more of a particular type of case or, you know, another way to put it, more clients than you have the capacity to provide the highest level of assistance to. Um, so in our particular study that we've been uh, trying to get underway, you know, still planning, uh, and still in the planning stages for, the setting is um, in victims of domestic violence who come to a legal services provider and seeking assistance with uh, obtaining civil protection orders um, from, from, uh, from courts. And the legal services provider has the capacity to assist in terms of providing full representation to, you know, around a third uh, of, of the folks who come to it who are eligible for the help, you know, income and asset eligible, um, and who are, who, are, are, who are actively seeking civil protection orders. Now, that, by the way, that number from, you know, that number one third would go down substantially if the legal services provider did more outreach. Um, in the community. So we've looked in the court systems where this LSP is operating. And in fact, you know, a substantial number of people are already in the court system seeking civil protection orders without counsel. And so it's sort of a, you only see the tip of the iceberg and even you can't even handle the tip of the iceberg in terms of providing full representation, a traditional attorney client relationship to these folks, much less the whole iceberg. So what do you do? And it turns out that in medicine, uh, again, to use that analogy, there, uh, there have been lot, there's been lots of study about how to make these triage decisions. It's both an ethical question and an operational question. Ethically, what do you want to do when you're in that sort of scarce situation? And that comes up both in medicine in terms of something like organ, uh, you know, when you don't have enough organ, organs for transplant. 
It comes up when you have Hurricane Katrina knocking out power in a hospital and you don't have enough uh, evacuation capacity to get all of your patients out of your hospital. And that was the subject of a recent Radio Lab episode. So there's an ethical dimension to that question. There's also an operational dimension. Suppose what you wanted to do was to say, we should use this, these resources to save the most lives. Or in the civil protection order context, we should use these resources to try to get as many people as possible civil protection orders, because that's what they're for and that's best for the community. How would you do that? How would you go about doing that? And one way you would go about thinking about it, um, the way that they do, that the, the military thinks about it when we're talking about battlefield casualties, is you say, well, try to distinguish people into three groups. One is uh, a group of people who are going to be able to succeed on their own. So in the in battlefield casualties, these are going to be people who are going to survive the battlefield, even if not assisted immediately. You don't provide immediate assistance to them or in the, in, in, in the legal services provider, people who are going to be able to get civil protection orders on their own, you don't offer full representation to them. For people who are never going to be able to survive on the battlefield or never going to be able to get civil, civil protection orders on their own, even if given the full representation, you don't give them full representation either because it's not affecting the outcome. What you, the people you do give battlefield assistance to or full representation to are the folks that you can change their outcome. You can, you know, if, if, you, if you give assistance, they'll survive or they'll get the civil protection order. If you don't give assistance, they won't survive or they won't get the civil protection order. So that's one way to think about it. But if you want to do that, you face the problem of how do you go about distinguishing those people? Because a lot of study in a lot of different settings, again, emergency room setting is one example turns out that's a very hard thing to do, to, to figure out who you can actually change the outcomes for. And so we're doing, we're pursuing a randomized experiment um, that's designed to try to add to our knowledge of how do you distinguish those folks. And, and most importantly, whether lawyers, given exercising professional judgment, can in fact predict which people really would benefit from the help. And, and I guess the, what you're what you're talking about raises a big issue for me, which is, let's give a concrete example. In New York City, they're talking about investing potentially $200 million more a year in hiring lawyers to represent um, people facing eviction in housing court. So there is actually more money now in, in areas of the law that where there, haven't been mu there hasn't been a lot of money uh, in the past. However, you're no doubt correct that there isn't enough money um, to cover every case at every moment. And so I guess having a RCT or a research study is a great, is great progress towards this habit of thinking in a kind of, I would use the term, problem-solving way. But how do we get to more fundamental change? How, how do you, is, what's the, the way to inculcate this way of thinking in a legal services organization in a more fundamental fashion? It's a, it's a really hard question and one that we've been scratching our heads about with the access, in the Access Justice Lab about, because you know, that's our overall mission. I mean, you know, one way of thinking about this is if the Access to Justice Lab is going to be you know, one of the few institutions around the country that's going to be doing randomized studies in the law, and, and we're going to depend on you know, those few institutions to produce evidence, we should stop. We're never going to be able to produce enough evidence, even as a lab and even as an institution. One, one, one or two institutions are never going to be able to do it just the same way you know, one set of one center, Johns Hopkins, can never produce enough randomized experiments in medicine to make progress in medicine you know, possible. And so we have to start a movement. We have to, you know, to, to get people to think this way um, uh, and to demand this evidence. The, you know, in terms of what the strategies we're pursuing in the Access to Justice Lab, we are, first of all, going to try to produce studies and try to educate folks about, hey, this is evidence from this study can be useful in your practice. It can, it can get you to think about ways that, you know, way other than the way you were thinking before um, or ask new questions about what you should be doing to be more effective. We're in the process of producing a short course so that folks who either want to do these uh, studies as researchers or to uh, form partnerships with researchers to get the study done, you know, and so these are field operators, um, will know more about what's required and how to do them. 
we will be doing, you know, persuasion in terms of just, you know, appearing at conferences and giving speeches and talking to anyone who will listen to us about why this is so critical. And quite frankly, we think that there is an ethical duty to do these studies, because if you think about it, you know, in the civil protection order context, there, you know, our view is that if we triaged more effectively, more people would have civil protection orders than currently do with no additional injection of resources. You know, when you think about it that way, there may be an ethical duty to do these studies as opposed to, you know, oh, well, they're just curiosities. We think ultimately that that we're going to need to persuade funders, uh, you know, to demand uh, evidence, maybe not demand the evidence, show it to me right now or I'll cut your funding. Rather say, you know, if you don't have the evidence, I want you to, uh, you know, you, this is a funder speaking to a legal services provider. I want you to engage in an evidence-based, you know, uh, in, in, in an evidence-gathering uh, study. And sure, I'll fund, you know, your study as long. I'll fund your your effort, your your your, your services as long as you are gathering evidence about whether those actually work. Well, this is fascinating work, uh, and and thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us again. I'm Aubrey Fox. I'm the guest host of the New Thinking podcast for the Center for Court Innovation, and joined today by. Uh, professor James Grenier, who's a professor of law at Harvard University and the faculty director of the Access to Justice Lab, and they have a great website that you can go online and take a look at some of the studies that they're participating in. Thank you so much, Jim. My pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity.